And our discussion leader, uh, whom some of you have met in previous uh, events with us, Paul Gibbons, is an international consultant. He's the founder of a company called Future Considerations, a London-based consultancy serving the global financial services market. He's author of a relatively new book published in 2014, The Science of Successful Organizational Change. He's a well-known public speaker, executive coach, and also an adjunct professor here at the Daniels College of Business. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul to start our discussion off. Uh, Dan and I had a very robust discussion about which topics to choose. Uh, I had some different ones, and he had some different ones. And what was interesting about that discussion is that these three topics do not by any means exhaust a list of ethical topics we could have brought up for 2015. These are some of the facts of the case. In Volkswagen, half a million cars were recalled. That soon became 11 million cars. The defeat device recognizes when the engine is being tested by the regulators. It reduces the nitrous oxide emissions, which are the most toxic. And then when the test has passed, they go back to normal settings, which improve the gas mileage and the CO2 emissions. So there's a trade-off there. And uh, the engineers found a way to defeat that. In FIFA, uh, this has been around. This is the worst kept secret in sports, apparently. Um, much like doping in, in biking and some of the doping in the Olympics, Sepp Blatter, S-E-P-P, -P, Blatter, was the president of FIFA and has been for a very long time. They're investigated for, he's investigated for 150 million in bribes. But the whole organization, I think there have been 19 arrests. Is that correct, Jamie? There have been 19 arrests, uh, several people in the United States in sports marketing organizations and several FIFA executives from around the world. And then finally on the LIBOR, I, um, I, I was a trader. I used to do this back in the 1980s for my sins. So LIBOR uh, may, again, not mean that much in the middle of the United States. $450 trillion of financial assets are priced off LIBOR. That's a lot of money, last I checked. Um, and there's all, it touches every aspect, every loan to every corporation, every loan to every sovereign, every <coughs> piece of sovereign debt in the world. Uh, it's, an extra, it's fundamental to the functioning of the international banking system. So there were two types of manipulations that happened. One was external, and one seems to imply collusions among the banks. And there's even a question about whether the British government were involved. And then finally, um, one of the things I think is very interesting is all of these things are very personal. One's own country, one's own self-interest. Self and frequently, those very personal concerns, the future of my car industry, the future of Wolfsburg, Germany, where uh, Volkswagens are made, the future of my country uh, and its place on the world stage in soccer, the future of my bank, the future of the banking industry. These are all deeply emotional concerns about which any normal human being would be deeply concerned. They frequently compete with ethical abstractions. You know, the words we talk about when we talk about values, honesty and integrity are abstract. And so these very deep emotional and personal concerns frequently compete with abstractions. One of the interesting points you brought up was the, the question of, uh, of bribery, which uh, doesn't always look like bribery. I know in England uh, they cracked down on it very hard in the last two decades. I've had government clients in England, I can't buy them a cup of coffee. And not, they are not allowed to accept a cup of coffee from me. I mean, we kind of joke about it. I said, let me get you lunch, and they're like, uh, we can't. Is that, to what extent is that the case in industries or the culture in different industries? Is, is anyone familiar with that kind of super strict regulation of uh, patronage or bribery, whatever you'd like to call it. Does anyone have some insight on that? We all, um, we all kind of perceive of the, the FIFA scandal as a bribery mm -hmm. scandal. They're not being charged with bribery, right? Because US bribery law does not go that far, right? It, uh, the FCPA is only about government, official, uh, government officials, and FIFA is not that. But I think the lesson to be learned from that is that the U.S. will find creative ways when it, you yeah. know, there is public incentive to do so. And so you'll see a wire fraud charge, you'll see a yeah. money laundering charge, which yeah. have extraterritorial scope. Uh, so as, as, with I, as with Al Capone, um, uh, it's, it's the money that got him and not the, the bullets in the blood. Right. Um, and that's very much the case here. It's RICO, it's racketeering, it's money laundering, it's tax evasion. So those are, those are where they're getting these guys and not particularly on buying votes on collusion around uh, the voting process, around bribery or anything like that. Because bribery is a very slippery thing, apparently, to define. Is that right? Oh, I don't know about that, but it's, it, <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, it's a little, 
uh, you know, I think it was just simply a function of, you know, U.S. law punishes, uh, federal U.S. law punishes foreign bribery when it's a bribery of a foreign public official. Uh, right. he, and, and here we just simply didn't have that. So we, right. you know, uh, the U.S. was incentivized to find other ways, and, and it has. It hit that pinnacle of like, well, why are we changing the rest of the leagues around the world to accommodate for this 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 World Cup in this country that it doesn't make sense. And there's also their force for good in a number of different ways, both for the rights of LGBT people, but also Russia, sport in Russia, unfortunately, is highly racist. And so there's a movement from the bottom up, from the grassroots, if you will, to boycott the Russian game by African players. And Russia are actually taking, in their credit, to their credit, some very proactive strength to stop out some of the racial language that's used it's very vulgar stuff, so I won't describe it any further, but some of the things that are done against black players when they play in Russia. So, and actually there's an, an enormous, I would say, force for good from the bottom up, from well, act, player activism, if you will. Yeah, and it comes from the superstars. It comes from the superstars of those teams that play in the most high profile leagues, the English Premier League, um, the ones that were on the African team saying that we're not going to play in Russia. And so there were players that came out, and I think that to answer your question once again, that th these World Cups, really, really put FIFA um, on display. Now, there's a very good book called The Halo Effect, which actually uh, actually would, would disagree somewhat with your point, that companies which are extremely well thought of, in a general sense, are actually given a free pass on lots and lots of things. The particular example in The Halo Effect, a book by Professor Rosenzweig, <laughs> um, uh, is Enron, it's a, a classic example. Uh, best place to work, number one, uh, number one employer in the company, accolades. Uh, going really almost up to the day uh, of collapse. And uh, his assertion is that journalists actually gave Enron a free pass for many, many years, and there was much, much going on uh, that he could have reported on earlier. I was a bank uh, investigator of some of the banking disasters of the 1990s, and one of the things that's almost always true is that where the disaster occurred had been the most profitable department beforehand. And that's an interesting yeah. thing. Yeah. And that is, I think, a function of the halo effect. That it's hard with all of the stresses and all the pressures and all the problems that you have to solve. When something's going well, it's very hard to take off the rose-tinted glasses and actually scrutinize it just as heavily as you would sure. something where something's failing. So I think it's a great, great, great point. Professor Holcomb, you made a, a very, very interesting point about the role of the whistleblower and whether we need actually a whistleblower policy. And I thought that was very interesting, um, having worked in banks, again, having worked in banks and having been an investigator in banks. Uh, it was interesting to me that these frauds, which seem minor on today's scale, a couple hundred million dollars, um, uh, a trivial amount rounding error. But um, having said that, with the amount of internal and external regulation on a bank, they had middle office regulation, back office regulation, front office regulation, compliance officers, internal audit, external audit, the UK equivalent of the SEC, uh, the UK equivalent of the department, just lots and lots of scrutiny. <coughs> and yet a couple of people managed to, with the knowledge of lots of people around them, there was plenty of smoke, but a couple of people managed to embezzle a couple hundred million dollars. So I, I, I found that, at the time, I found that interesting, because we often think about structural solutions. We'll put in a function, or we'll put in an officer, or we'll put in a, uh, some sort of governance process, or we'll put in something hard. But in fact, it seems to me uh, this is a hypothesis, I throw this out to everybody as a question, is can you ever build a good enough mousetrap? Mm -hmm.